Hi, and welcome to this special election edition of Newsmakers. I'm Jerry Roberts. Tonight, a conversation with Megan Harmon, who represents District 6 on Santa Barbara City Council. She was appointed to the seat early this year, and no other candidate filed a run against her in the November election. In future shows, we'll also hear from candidates in Districts 1 and 2 and from Oscar Gutierrez in District 3, who's also unopposed. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. So let's unpack this. So you were appointed by vote of four members of City Council to serve in the District 6 seat vacated when Greg Hart was elected to the soups, effective until the next election, which is November 5th. But nobody filed a run against you, so the board appointed you to serve through the end of the heart term, which ends in 2021. Have I got that right? That's correct. All it's right. a tangled web, but you got it. That's a pretty sweet gig. You don't have to <laughs> campaign. campaign. You, you think that's good for democracy? You know, I, I think reasonable minds can say that it's not great that someone else didn't put their name into the ring. But the truth is, regardless of whether or not I had an opponent, I'm going to be out there knocking on doors, talking to my neighbors. I'm new to politics, so it's really been important to me since the appointment that I get out and meet the people people that I'm representing, and I'm committed to continuing to do that um, regardless of, of what happens in November. All right, well, let's let people know something about when and where were you born? I was born in Lompoc, so I hail from North County um, in the late 80s. Never ask a girl her age, Jerry. You're not a girl. <laughs> <Where are> you? <laughs> um, yeah, so I... You Did know, you have siblings? I have an older brother, yeah, a couple years older, and we grew up together and, and went through the public school system my whole life. and. Really, you know, Lompoc was a wonderful place for me to grow up. It's a small, close. How does it compare to Santa Barbara? It's smaller, and um, it's really a, a working class community. And I think that is really where I got my what's important to me in terms of standing up for working families and strengthening our middle class. It's it's born out of where I grew up and, and the community that shaped me. And it, it was so wonderful to come to Santa Barbara and, and see that as well. So it really was Santa good. Barbara's representative in Congress, Salud Carbajal, got in trouble for saying Lompoc was an <laughs> armpit. Do you agree or disagree with Salud? Well, I don't agree with that statement. I mean, I'm from there. So my heart, you know, I really do um, love it and I appreciate it. And right. everybody likes a good joke, though. So yeah. <laughs> I think we've I all it. moved on from right. that. So where, so the Lompoc Public Schools, and then what'd you do? I went to college on the East Coast at Wellesley College, which is an all-women's institution. And Hillary Clinton alum. True, and Madeleine Albright, and Madam Shanghai Shek. So there's, there's no, quite a few notables. All right. um, so what year did you graduate? I graduated from college in 2008 and okay. went directly to graduate school where I got my master's in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard. Um, and I've then heard of that. I hear you went there. Oh, no. <laughs> Anyway, um, and then decided to take a little bit of time off from academia, and that's when I really dug into humanitarian aid work, which um, is really a passion of mine. I spent a year in Afghanistan doing a large-scale development project, um, and then came back to law school to get some practical skills, and I graduated from New York University before heading back west. So you got all of your uh, education and contacts on the East Coast, but decided to move back. Was that always your plan? You know, it really was. My heart is here. You know, it's such a wonderful place to, to grow up. And I knew that I wanted to have a family and that I wanted that for my family. So I think it was always, um, always on the radar. All right. And when did you land in Santa Barbara? Gosh, I guess two and a half years ago now. So I'm still relatively new, though um, I think of myself as Santa Barbara and through and through. But when I had my daughter, it really became important to me that we prioritize community and building community locally. Um, and so we made our way here. And when the seat opened up uh, and it was uh, the, uh, the council was going to make an appointment, what was your thought process there? What did, what, did you immediately say, I'm going to do that with the kind of ambition that, <laughs> that you've accused you're me of having? You're so widely known or <laughs> did you think it through for a while? You know, it was actually a little bit of a difficult decision, I have to say, because um, I didn't know tons of folks. I, I know my neighbors. I know other moms that I hang out with on the playground. I know community members. And I'd had some really amazing conversations with them about what we wanted to see at the city level. But I didn't, I hadn't met any of the council members, for example, except very briefly. Um, so it was tough. But you got four <laughs> votes. You got four votes. How did that happen? Oh, uh, Fate? Who voted for you? <laughs> um, gosh, it was Councilmember Snedden, Rouse, Dominguez, and Mayor Maria. 
Um, and you had met with all of them prior? I met with everybody. So, I, you know, for me, I thought, well, what a great opportunity to have conversations with folks that are really engaged in the process of policymaking and share with them my perspective and, and what our community and my neighborhood values. And that was really how I approached the entire process. And um, I was so grateful just for the experience and, and then obviously thrilled and humbled and honored to be, to be selected. How would you characterize your politics? Are you to the right or left of Bernie Sanders? <laughs> I thank you for that framing, that's great. Um, to the left, right, I think. Oh gosh, no, no way, no, no way. You know what, I'm a progressive. And that is how I've always understood myself. That's the, what does that mean? I want to enact policies that are good for people. And that's what progressivism means to me. It means putting people first, people above corporate interests, people above party even. Um, and, and so that's really where my values are. But I, you know, again, I think on the council, our job is to really keep that focus, to think not about a party line necessarily or a, a specific party ideology, but to think about what's good for our neighbors and what will work for our neighbors and make their lives better. And that's what I try to do every day. And you're an attorney. I am. And I am. Uh, you, But you work for a huge corporate law firm, do you not? I actually don't. I don't. So I, I used to work for a huge corporate law firm and have since transitioned to a local Santa Barbara firm. Um, and I've, I've loved it. It's really been... And what kind of law do you do? I do a little bit of everything. My specialty is still real estate finance. That's you know where I'm trained and, and where I'm most comfortable. But what's great about practicing locally is you get exposed to all different areas of law. And I'm learning and I'm being challenged and being stretched. And the people in our community are just such wonderful people that I'm really grateful. Well, as an attorney, you are no doubt familiar with Article 2, Section 6A of the California Constitution, are you not? Uh, can't say that I know it verbatim. Well, it states that uh, uh, people, uh, elections for city council and other local races shall be nonpartisan. <laughs> Do you agree or disagree with that? It's a nonpartisan office. Hmm. So I, I absolutely agree. And I think it is nonpartisan. I, but you sought the endorsement of the Democratic Party, nonetheless. Yeah, but it doesn't, that doesn't mean that my decision-making decision is partisan. But I, I also think this idea that whether someone identifies as a Democrat or is endorsed by the Democratic Party, that that makes council politics political. No, I mean, we all have values. We all have lenses through which we take these decisions. And, and I don't think my community wants me to leave my values at the door. And I don't think that's what they ask of me when they want me to go up there and take votes. They, they want me to bring that perspective to these votes. And I think that's a good thing. And I don't think it makes it political. I think it makes it engaged with the issues, and it, it makes us better for it to bring those values to the table. Isn't it the case that one of the uh, uh, commitments that you make in getting the Democratic endorsement is that you will uh, work for the, uh, the program that is outlined in, the, in, its, uh, in its platform? I don't remember that being a specific requirement. But of course, you know, if, if you seek an endorsement, the, the underlying theory is that you share the values of that organization that's endorsing you more than you don't. Um, and it's, it's not a big lift for me to support progressive policy because those are the values that I hold. And I think those are the values that my constituents hold. And they're the values that will allow me to produce policy that's best for my neighbors. What is District 6? District, well, I like to call it the downtown district. So it goes from about Cottage Hospital at Alamar and kind of continues down State Street. It's um, bordered by the freeway. It goes all the way up to Coda, and there's a couple cutouts. Um, but it really is the heart of our downtown, and it's, it's a great place to live. I love living there. How many people live in District 6? About 15,000. And how would you characterize it? the population socioeconomically? Is it mostly homeowners, renters, older people, students, what? Um, we're at last count 81% renters. And I, I have a theory that that number is even higher now. That's based purely on anecdotal evidence, but we are mostly renters. Um, there's a really interesting mix. We've got a ton of young folks, a, a ton of folks engaged in the service profession. We've also got young families and senior citizens. So it's an interesting dynamic. Why do you point to me when you say senior citizens? <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> but it's, 
it's great. And socioeconomically, look, we are a more working class district. And that's something that I am proud of. It's something that I think is to be celebrated. And it's what I stand for on that dais. I want to encourage growth of our middle class. And that's who we are in the 6th district. Um, are you a renter? I am most definitely a renter. Do you favor rent control? I think rent stability is the stabilization is a really complicated issue. We've seen in a lot of cities where it hasn't worked, and I think we would be remiss if we would ignore that evidence. But I also think it's a real crisis, the um, affordability of space. I mean, it, it, is, it is putting so much pressure on our working families that I, I think we have to think about all the tools available to us to solve this problem. The pressure being what, higher rents all higher, the time? Uh, just obscene rents. Um, and you know, I, I hear folks when they say that's what the market will bear, but by the same token, if we want to have a robust middle class and we want to facilitate working families staying in the community in which they serve, then we have to think about all the tools available to us to ameliorate that problem. So that's a yes. You're, you're in favor. I, th I think that we have to think about the full menu of options. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not ready to take anything off the table at this point. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, so in District 6, then, uh, you then would be personally responsible for the conditions on the teeming hellhole known as State Street. Is that correct? <laughs> Way to put a fine point on it right there. I'm personally responsible. Tell me yes. about State Street. What I mean, what's, what's the problem and what, what, where, what's the solutions? There are so many factors that go into State Street being the way that it is. I mean, not least of which, right, retail has changed. And we now have, what, 12 blocks of retail space. And it's just not the way the world works anymore with folks buying things online and, and a different desire out of their shopping experience. People are looking for something more experiential rather than just go into a store, buying what they need, and, and moving on. So. That's a challenge. Um, to me, I think one of the great things that we can do is encourage mixed use downtown. I think that's what my neighbors want, and that's a great way to bring new life to that and how area. Does that, how does that manifest? Well, I think we're going to have to find the right set of incentives for developers to build housing downtown. Um, I understand it's really expensive land, and we're going to have to figure out what that looks like. Look, I'm, I'm not a planner myself, so I can't tell you exactly what how that bundle of sticks is going to be arranged to make it work. But I think it's our job to talk to them, to talk to the Planning Commission, and try to triangulate some solution to get housing built downtown. And then people are going to use State Street as their living room. The more people that are on State Street, the better off we're going to be, the better off businesses are going to be. And I think it only portends good things if we think creatively about should we Should we close several blocks of State Street for a pedestrian mall? The correct answer is yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? And, why, I, and yeah. why haven't we? I mean, everybody. I mean, that seems to be a, a very popular idea. It, you know, it's it's a big change, and something that is really wonderful about Santa Barbara, but also a little bit difficult, is that we sometimes um, are a little averse to change, and we want to think about it and talk about it a lot. I feel confident that we are finally at a place where people are really excited to try creative things, and that's. I was just having a conversation about it today, and I, I think. I think we're finally at that tipping point, and I, I would love to. Um, and I think business owners, you know, they're a little concerned about what it means for their business, but I truly believe that um, everyone's on board with experimenting, and much like if the rent situation, I don't want to take any options off the table. So you, the council recently re received the Cosmont report <laughs> for $84,000 to tell them what everybody already knew. But the thing that really jumped out at me was the... Um, uh, criticism of the mm. planning and permitting process uh, run by the Community Development Office. The city does not have a business-friendly reputation, e.g. difficult entitlement and permitting rules. City staff is not enthusiastic to expedite development. Permit process for new retailers is expensive and high, high risk, and on and on and on. What are you doing it's about true. that? Well, it's a culture change, and it requires leadership from the top. I mean, I think we as a council have um, spoken with one voice about the need to improve customer service, about the need to streamline these processes. And it's our job to do that. And I, culture doesn't change overnight, but I feel really good. Maybe I'm naive, but I'm excited about where we are. I'm really getting this sense that folks are trying to implement some of the strategies for performing better for their customer. Um, but, but we got to continue to tell 
the people that work in that department, it's important to us. We have to continue to keep an eye on it and to stand up for you know, doing better for the people that come in. Isn't it the case that the city bureaucracy is really driving the wagon and that uh, you know, they'll, they'll do their best to just keep you out of the way so they can continue doing what they've always done? No, I don't think that's true. I, you know, bureaucracy, of course, makes the wheels of change move slower, but it's our job as leaders to say, this is the direction we want to go in. So and how are you going to fix that? I think we've already started. I think that meeting, that Cosmont meeting, was a really important meeting where, to a person, we all stood up and said, this has to change. This is important to us. This needs to be you know, done yesterday. Um, and I think it's also about being willing to empower staff to make decisions. And I, I think we're there. I think it's, it's a community effort, and everyone understands that we're now at a point that we really want to see change. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful. It is a culture. It's a, I mean, anybody who's built, tried to build anything bigger than a doghouse in Santa Barbara, I'm told, uh, <laughs> runs up against the culture of no. And it's yeah. also, uh, it's built on uh, complaints. So any complaint is immediately taken seriously and sent to the top of the list, no matter how absurd it is. Yeah. So it really, uh, is that going to take some uh, serious leadership change over there? I don't know about that. I mean, because look here, it's a balancing act also, because on the one hand, we have this beautiful city and this character that is so unique and that we all feel so strongly about. And how did we get there? Well, part of how we got there is by this you know, onerous and difficult process. So I don't know that we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, let's get rid of it all and build, build, build. But we do need to empower people to have some flexibility. And I think it starts by us making those statements publicly. And we've done that, um, and I'm excited to see where we go. Is the city going to hire an economic development director? Yes, we are. In fact, I heard... And why? Well, the job descri description is going to go out soon, I think in the next few days, which is, which is great. And why we're going to do it? Well, there needs to be someone that can plug in, that can kind of coalesce all of the different community groups, all of the different resources. We have a lot of people that are really excited and really engaged with the question of revitalizing downtown. One of the challenges for them, and I've heard this to a person, is they don't know who to go to. They don't know where to plug in. And there's a lot of disparate sort of elements, a lot of disparate pieces to this puzzle. And how I see this economic vitality director is almost like the, the hub of the wheel with the different spokes. And everybody can go in to this person and really plug in, and that person can take a 50,000 foot view and say, here's where we're lacking, here's what we need, um, and kind of think, can be a visionary. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm excited to see who applies. Who's gonna hire? Is the council gonna get that hire, or is Paul Casey gonna decide? You know, I think that's determined by the charter, so I wouldn't wanna say. I, I assume it's, it's Mr. Casey. All right. How big is the city budget? Gosh, I don't even know the exact number. No? Yeah. I don't. Hundred million? <laughs> How much of that is uh, in pension liabilities? Well, look, this is not a problem just for the no, city of Santa Barbara. But it is a problem for Santa Barbara. It is a problem for Santa Barbara. It's a problem in the state of California. Um, and we are well aware of it. I mean, it's a, a big part of the conversation anytime the budget comes up. And I encourage anyone who is interested in talking about pension liabilities and unfunded liabilities to participate in the commission we have that's talking about this issue. Um, I think it's a, a really interesting way to plug into this subject, and it's something that I'm looking forward to learning more about, so I will be attending those meetings as well. But I highly encourage anyone watching to think about joining that conversation. Because it's, 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 the, it's the line item that's going to eat the, the whole budget. I mean, if it continues on its, on, its, on its path, so that really needs fixing. Uh, yeah, but this is, I mean, again, this is one of those things where, you know, we do have to think critically and creatively, but, um, you know, the state has a large role to play in that as well, and it's part of a larger national conversation um, about the future of, of entitlement programs generally. So it, I'm, I'm excited to be part of that conversation and to be in government when we're thinking about those solutions. So will you commit here tonight that you will take the prime leadership position and Fixing the pension liability <laughs> issue for the city. Well, I'm not going to take it on my shoulders tonight, but we'll see. All right. So the the council, I, by the way, I, I want to commend you about one thing, which was when the council voted to that you didn't have to be on the ballot, that you were just going to be appointed for the remainder of this term, you did not vote for yourself. 
you abstained. And I, I thought that was the correct position to take, and I, yeah. I just I didn't want to forget to commend you for that. Um, but. There's always a but. The, uh, <laughs> the council also voted, with you in the minority, to close the parks at 8 p.m. <sighs> Because it's not of, even eight. It's a half hour after sunset. Okay, half hour after sunset. We're we're still in daylight savings. So, <laughs> why did you vote against that? There's a big problem in the park. It parks at night. I I agree that the parks are a challenge in terms of safety, in terms of rule following. But to me, I didn't understand how limiting our citizens' ability to use those parks by shutting them down early was going to solve that problem. It didn't give anyone any extra tools that they didn't already have. Look, if someone's a problem in the park because they're doing drugs, doing drugs is illegal. So let's arrest them for that. Let's not take away the ability of our citizens to enjoy the parks. Um, and I, I had a real problem, frankly, with uh, the potential punishments that could be applied. I mean, that that was, it was a misdemeanor? It, it could have been a misdemeanor. But now um, it's not. Now it can't be. And now it can't be. And I'm really proud that we took so that what vote. what does that mean? You get a ticket? Or you get, it's an infraction, yeah. Um, but to me, I thought, wow, I don't know how I can justifiably support a rule by which someone, let's say they were out on parole and they were enjoying the park and they happened to be there at 8.15 p.m., they could go back to jail if they got a misdemeanor ticket for being in the park they could be incarcerated again. And I just, to me, I, you know, a lot of people said, that'll never happen, that'll never happen, and that wasn't good enough for me. That was not an answer that was acceptable, and I'm, I'm really grateful to my colleagues for reconsidering, and um, I think we came to a, a compromise that, that folks are comfortable with. Well, do you agree with me that your position on that issue was really driven by the fact that you wanted your husband <laughs> to be able to play soccer <laughs> at night? I need my alone time, Jerry, okay? No, you know what? I just used him as a convenient example, and I, I will feel about I it. will be hearing about it until the end of time. Yeah, believe me, it'll be in the obit. I so, know. Yeah, Megan Harmon, comma, who once said voted against closing the park because her husband played soccer. It's, at it's night, I'll never live it down. Yeah. It's true. Was he, was he upset with you for that? Well, I didn't tell him. So the real problem was when he read it in the indie the next day. So that was a little bit of a surprise. But no, he wasn't. I mean, look, he, he is on the same page as I am about this issue. And he was a convenient example and one that I thought people would, would be able to internalize. How'd that work out? Poorly. I lost. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so do, do you think, uh, staying on the park issue and people staying in the parks afterwards for a minute, there's been an increase in the number of homeless people in Santa Barbara, correct? I think that the numbers actually bear out the opposite of that. It, there's been a reduction. What role do you feel that Proposition 47, which called for a release of uh, people throughout the state for so-called you know, low-level crimes, has played in, in the homeless population? Do you see any intersection there at all? I don't know that there's such a direct correlation between incarceration and release and homelessness. I think the connection is better drawn between drug abuse and homelessness and the absence of um, opportunities for folks to you know, deal with their addiction issues. So that's really where I would, would kind of reframe it all together. Well, yeah, that's a good idea because uh, the whole notion of homelessness implies that it is a housing problem when in fact it's an addiction about 80% of the, of, the, of the resources that go into homelessness are uh, uh, mental health and addiction, is it not? That's what I hear. That's what they tell me. But it is effective when you spend that money in that way. I mean, we recently got a HEAP grant and it in the last few months has, um, has been rolling out and part of that is a huge emphasis on dealing with mental health, having health practitioners go out into the field to work with folks. And I've been hearing from community members that they already see a really vast improvement, but it's, it really has changed in just the few months since the HEAP grant monies have been utilized. And I think that proves sort of a, at an anecdotal level that what we need to do is think about the source of the problem. Um, and, and that's a, a key part of the conversation about homelessness. Um. Newsmakers TV, uh, and I name no names, was the only one to predict correctly that you would win the appointment to the city council because of our deep institutional knowledge and connectedness, but also because uh, 
it was understood that your position on the so-called so project labor, labor agreement, which would guarantee jobs on public works projects, five million and over to uh, crafts union members only, um, was that you were against it, but yet your first major vote was in favor of it. Why did you change? Well, I'm shocked that you're asking about this. Shocked. <laughs> Look, you know, um, and they're both our viewers. <laughs> I know, I'll do Not that again. <laughs> yeah. I I don't think that that characterization is accurate. And let me tell you this: I I I think the conversation about the PLA that we're having even now it's a little bit disingenuous, and I mean that in the kindest way possible, mm. because we don't have the deal yet. We haven't negotiated the deal yet, so we can't talk about the specific contours of the agreement and talk about whether or not it works for the city of Santa Barbara. So the conversation that we're actually having, and it's a really important one, is about our philosophical orientation toward unions. And I was really clear on this you know, when I was having conversations. I represent, a, in the 6th District, there's a lot of working class folks and our families, and we struggle to make ends meet. We struggle to pay rent, to put food on the table, to pay for childcare, and our job as legislators is to do what we can to ease that burden. In my view, my philosophical orientation is such that, that unions and membership in a union, that's a good thing. Facilitating that does provide good jobs. It provides security. It provides an opportunity for local folks to make you know, a, a dignified living and allows them to keep their families in the community in which they serve. So, Of course, the argument is that people who are here, living here now, working who are not in unions, are going to be forced to double pay on benefits and do things like well, that. Well, again, this is part of the negotiation. I mean, we'll see when we get the contours of the deal. And I think the council's spoken quite strongly that we need to negotiate something that works for the city. But frankly, you know, if the outcome of a PLA, and I do think it's its sort of overarching purpose, is to encourage unionization in our communities, that's a good thing for my neighbors. My neighbors want that because they need access to good jobs and they want a strong middle class and they see that as a path forward. So, um, all yeah. right. I'll, I'll, I'll let it and go. And newspaper for, men uh, used to be unionized. I'm, so I've I don't led know two where... strikes. I'm not anti union at all. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, I'm against higher costs on public works projects. And people who were not told when they voted for Measure C, which raised their own taxes, that this is the direction that it was going to go in. That was a betrayal. Okay, well, on that note, you know, I haven't had many folks bring that complaint to me. But speaking of commissions that people can get excited about, I really encourage anyone who has any budgetary concerns, this included, to participate in, first of all, the budget conversations, but also the Measure C Oversight Committee. It's an opportunity for you to bring these concerns. I mean, it, the committee is entirely about oversight of those funds. So I look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. All right, well, thank you very much. Congratulations thank on you. your, uh, whatever, reappointment. <laughs> well, you know, you're going to be around for a couple more years, so you'll come back and see us, I hope. <laughs> and uh, thanks for coming, and thank you for your service on City Council, thank I want to say. Uh, thank you all for watching, and please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond. And if your insomnia is particularly troubling, check out our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and interviews. Special thanks to our peerless director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Kyle and Lizzie, and as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy senior executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.